Hey, what's up guys? This is Coach Caglione here. This is another edition of our Gag Schools Updates, the Road to 198 series. Uh, so uh, basically kind of moving forward, I've uh, been doing some transitions with the training in the diet specifically. Um, so if you guys have been following along with the start of the series, uh, basically um, over the last two years I've been kind of chronicling my weight loss. I've lost over 100 pounds uh, in the past two years or so. Uh, give or take, depending on what I eat uh, for that particular day. And uh, more recently, in the past month, I did a little bit of like a keto, kind of low carb, kind of challenge for myself. Um, and that went pretty well. I lost about a little, little bit of body fat. It wasn't, and the whole kind of idea there was just to kind of um, challenge myself mentally and also just kind of uh, help kind of uh, keep myself in check during the holiday time. Uh, this could be a very hard time for a lot of people, which is with all the, you know, holiday parties and engagements going on, family time, that sort of thing. So um, that being said, I know for me, um, I kind of, I know I ended up cutting uh, my, uh, that kind of low carb keto kind of program a little bit short, uh, just because the last two weeks specifically for me, I've been feeling like really under the weather. I haven't, I felt like I haven't, uh, my, uh, and I haven't really been, I can't tell you the last time I was sick, but I felt like I had like kind of flu like sim symptoms for the past uh, two weeks or so, kind of running nose, scratchy throat, that sort of thing. I've been feeling a lot better since I've kind of reintroduced some carbohydrate and some more fruit back into the diet. Um, whether that was just being, maybe I was in too low of a calorie deficit or just not getting enough micronutrients, I'm not really sure, um, or just the recovery factor. But, you know, that being said, my workout's been pretty good. But I will say that my workouts and my, uh, my lifting, it, again, it's only been a... Uh, only been a couple of days so far, but just reintroducing carbs, I feel really good uh, physically, mentally, and strength-wise. Uh, the reason, one of the reasons I decided to uh, introduce the carbs uh, back into the diet a little bit earlier uh, than planned is I decided to do uh, a little bit of a fun challenge, which I alluded to in the last episode. And I went to my buddy CJ's gym, ATS Strength, uh, in West Berlin, New Jersey. It was for a strong for a cause, and uh, basically, um, you know, one of the things I want to make sure that we kind of uh, hit home today when we do these kind of these little challenges um, I think competition is important uh, for your kind of your body your mind and your soul that sort of thing and I think also uh, just kind of the art of competing is competing is a skill uh, so especially if you have if you were not a former athlete before just doing like these little mini competitions uh, whether they're sanctioned events or not so that that could be always like a whole thing like what federation is in that, that sort of thing uh, in, in the context of powerlifting. But I think just doing some of these fun challenges, uh, just getting outside your comfort zone, like one of the other things I like to do every year, I like to do a, a Memorial Day Murph as well. Uh, it's like the one CrossFit workout I, I kind of do. I try to do that once a year. Uh, you know, you're just kind of doing these little events and also some of these particular events and that one in particular as well is for a cause. And Strong for a Cause is, you know, named that way for a reason. and. Uh, we do some charity events here at Wellick Agri on Strength and Bench for Boobs, for example, in October for breast cancer. Uh, so this particular charity uh, event was for a member at CJ's gym who uh, got diagnosed with thyroid cancer. And the, the family was going to need some help paying for some of the doctor bills and, and things like that. So they raised, uh, collectively as a group, they raised, and, and myself included, uh, raised about $2,000 for the family uh, to help with the, the treatment for the thyroid cancer. So it was a really cool thing. Um, and I think it's a really important, again, one of the points I want to bring home today is that if you are, whether it be a charity event or not, uh, I think it's really important that you uh, support your local, uh, your local contests, your local strength events, your local, just events in general, uh, but especially as far as the powerlifting sense, you know, it's definitely growing a lot with social media and all that stuff, but the way we're really going to grow the sport and the way we're going to really build a stronger community is actually helping out and volunteering, spectating and participating in the events it starts at the local level first uh so definitely you know spectate volunteer help out help spot and load uh if you're at the level where you have the knowledge you know get in the chair and judge you know sitting behind the computer screen is great and tapping the like button is great uh, but actually doing things in real life is going to make the biggest difference and especially an event like this um you know even like for myself i made a you know a donation obviously and i'm sure that the family was very appreciative of that uh, but even more so for you know having someone like myself where where i'm not like the strongest guy in the world especially not anymore you know having like a you know a strength coach in the area that kind of put themselves on the line uh you know i wanted to put up some good numbers and i kind of did that for the crowd just to get the crowd involved and just kind of you know be there uh, for my buddy cj and help it helped out help out the cause so 
Um, so recapping that event, you know, kind of didn't really do any type of deload or anything for this. There was no peaking. Uh, so one of the events was a trap bar deadlift. For those who don't, don't know, it's a hexagon uh, kind of kind of shape. Uh, it's called a hex bar deadlift, or you know, it's, it's basically a hexagon or like a square shape, depending on like the model of it. There's different. Uh, brands and things, but essentially you stand within the bar. So the, the advantage of a trap bar deadlift, uh, especially if you're like a general population or an athlete that maybe does not really care about competing in powerlifting, uh, it's kind of like a hybrid squat slash deadlift where the bar is in your hands and the weight's gonna be at your side. So you're gonna actually be, uh, it's a little bit more mechanically safe and efficient because you're within uh, the center of the bar. So the barbells, the weight is actually over your midfoot, whereas in the case of a straight bar deadlift, the weight, uh, you know, even if you're pulling sumo, even if you're pulling really good form conventional, the weight is always actually out in front of you. So it's a little bit easier on the low back. Um, again, it's not like, a, you know, it could be, I like the trap bar deadlift for athletes um, and stuff, but again, for us here at Agagli on Strength, now we use more of the straight bar just because most of our lifters, whether it be recreationally or competitively, are getting ready for powerlifting meets. So. But it's just, a, it is worth noting, it is a good option to train. And it was something, I used to do the trap bar deadlift a lot for football and wrestling when I was, when I was in high school and I loved it a lot. Um, when I was training for, I did a strongman show many, many years back. Um, my best, my PR on the trap bar, I've done 700 for five uh, before, so I wasn't really sure, uh, especially being 100 pounds lighter, what I was gonna be able to hit. Uh, so I, to be honest, I kind of went into it, especially without any tape or anything. I was like, I'd be happy with anything over 600. Uh, so I did, you know, we, were, we did, a, it was a rising bar deadlift, so we couldn't necessarily pick our attempts, but we made 50 pound jumps and, you know, it started to feel, started to feel a little bit heavier uh, once we got to 500 pounds, because I haven't pulled anything over 400 pounds uh, since my contest. So uh, I was happy, you know, moved 605, uh, moved 655 was a challenge, but I felt I had some more in the tank. And then we went up to 695, which would have been a triple body weight deadlift for me. Uh, but I could not budge that thing off the ground. But I was happy pulling the 655. Uh, I haven't done the trap bar in a while, so that was really cool. You know, for what it's worth, it was the most that anyone pulled on that particular day. I had, there was some uh, young kid that pulled the same as me, which kind of bothered me a bit, but uh, <laughs> that's part of the game. So it was cool. Uh, and then we moved on to do just some chin-ups. Wasn't the strictest form. I wasn't really locking on my elbows all the way. Uh, but I think this is also another thing that's kind of worth noting because some people get really uh, bent out of shape with as far as whether it be squat depth or pauses or things like that. Uh, part of athletics is adjusting to the judging standard, whether it be, you know, good, worse, you know, higher, lower standard, whatever. Um, you know, if you're a baseball player, I've never seen a baseball player tell an umpire, hey, you know, I thought that ball was a strike. You know, it's just, the umpires are going to call it like how they see it. Uh, and sometimes in some sports in football, they have instant replays and stuff like that. And that might be a cool feature, especially for all-time world records. That some sort of there could be some sort of video review for all-time world records in powerlifting. I think that'd be a really neat thing, uh, especially if it's you know, or just a federation record in general. Especially if we have the technology to do so, uh, where you could have some videos from the sides, some videos from the front. They have like a judges review. Uh, one of the things I do like uh, in like the IPF and the USAPL, they do have like committee where you can like overturn a call. I don't really see it happen too often, but that is something you can go to the to the jurors table. So I would like to see some sort of like video review, but. That being said, I just kind of want to note that, you know, so I ended up doing, a, I hit a personal record of 20 chin-ups, which I really surprised myself. Uh, like I said, that being said, the standard could have been better, uh, but the fact I got my, my chinny chin chin over the bar 20 times was pretty cool, because that's the most I've done by far in a long time. I might have been able to do that before uh, in my back in my, in my wrestling days when I was wrestling uh, 189 and 215, uh, but yeah, I haven't done, you know, anything more than like 10 or 12 chin-ups in a very, very long time. And it's worth noting also from a training standpoint, uh, most of the time when I do chin-ups, I might only do anywhere from three to five reps, and I do lots of sets and lower reps. It's kind of greasing the groove technique, so you can uh, improve your kind of uh, relative strength, and you can improve your reps uh, by just by increasing your volume. You don't necessarily have to be going to failure all the time. So it's worth kind of noting uh, that you know I trained with kind of very low repetitions and high amount of sets uh, for my chin-ups, and I was able to kind of improve my chin-up uh, score quite a bit. So worth noting, um, kind of like grease the groove technique is really good for body weight training. It's really good if you want to kind of improve your chin ups, push ups, and things like that. Because uh, if you're always kind of training to failure, always training in a fatigue state, your form breaks down, you kind of lose that technique. 
Uh, so you kind of develop those bad habits. And, I, and I'd say the same goes for squat, bench, and deadlift as well. So it's just kind of worth noting uh, that you, know, you want more quality repetitions over quantity in general. It's a good kind of way to go. And then we finish off with the prowler push. I tried to be fancy and kind of jump over the sled uh, for that. That was kind of more of a speed challenge. I wasn't really good with that, uh, but did my best. And moving on to training, uh, so this is the first week that I'll, I'm reintroducing the belt. Uh, last week, um, you know, I just did, you know, I've been kind of doing a linear progression with my uh, barbell exercise uh, since the meet. So I just started with very, very modest weights. Uh, now that I'm kind of over, uh, I'm kind of back over doing like 400 pounds for sets of eight on my squats and deadlifts. Now I'm kind of reintroducing the belt once again. Uh, and then on, on bench press, uh, I'm kind of back over doing like, again, nothing earth shattering, but since my kind of shoulder injury, uh, I'm very happy that I'm kind of back to doing, you know, over 225 uh, pain-free, knock on wood. Uh, I was able to do um, 255 pounds today for eight, and I felt like I still had more in the tank. So again, while it's nowhere near my, my best all-time set of eight on a bench, it's 315 for eight. Uh, so I, need, I still have a little ways to go before I get kind of back up to my all-time best numbers. Uh, but especially at this body weight, especially coming off a shoulder injury uh, from my last contest at Slingshot Record Breakers. Very happy with the progress so far. Uh, so again, like I said before, we'll kind of be reintroducing the belt. I'm still going to be doing like more uh, uh, kind of what I would consider kind of underloading type exercises. So I'm going to still do like squats and heels and deficit deadlifts and feet up benching and things like that because it's still more of like a hypertrophy type block for me. And I will do some gear testing uh, toward the end of 2018, uh, moving into 2019, so I can get an idea of what weights I'm gonna be doing. Uh, I kind of spoke about the diet a little, a little bit already, so my weight has kind of gone up really drastically in the last couple of days, but that being said, I did have some, I did have a couple of treat meals. I kind of, um, you can kind of learn from my mistakes, um, especially going from low carb to back tr into transitioning into a carbohydrate, uh, uh, I guess a carbohydrate, uh, focused diet, uh, it's important that you transition slowly and it's important that you kind of be able to transition from diet to diet a little more seamlessly. I did not do a good job of that. I kind of went off the rails a little bit. I had some pizza. I went out to have some Mexican food. Uh, I had, you know, went out to eat with uh, after the Strong for a Cause event. So I probably uh, ate out like kind of three times in a row. So the amount of glycogen and sodium that I'm storing and stuff. So I've been, I literally gained 10 pounds over the course of a couple of days. So obviously most of that is water weight, but it's worth noting. Uh, that it's just not really good from a habit standpoint either. I probably should have only maybe had one cheat, treat meal and not several over the course of the weekend. As you can see, like you get a positive or negative momentum. In this case, uh, just reintroducing the carbs too quickly uh, caused some negative momentum and some bad choices, having some processed carbs and some bread and things like that, and pizza, kind of more junk food. But I'm kind of back on the plan today. Uh, I'm going to keep the carbs a little bit higher for the time being and then progress, start to take some carbs and fats away as I get closer to the contest. So I've been as heavy, you know, like I said, uh, after weighing myself today, I was as heavy as 239 pounds, uh, which is the heaviest I've weighed in a while. But I know it's mostly just glycogen and water weight, so we'll kind of see how things, um, you know, so I'm not going to panic or anything, but obviously uh, that's not exactly where I want to be as far as for making 198 class, it's way too heavy, because um, I've been sitting at 230 for the last month. But again, that being said, when you're on a low carb diet, you're gonna be a little bit more glycogen de depleted. You're not gonna have the carbohydrates to kind of hydrate you. Uh, so you're gonna obviously just weigh, weigh a little bit less on the scale and that's kind of worth noting for people that um, choose a low carb approach versus a high carb approach. The benefit of having more carbs in your system besides the performance benefits is that when you're in a weight cutting situation, you can pull those carbohydrates away because the glycogen uh, can Weigh, weigh quite a bit if once you kind of take that out and kind of deplete your glycogen stores and then you want to replenish them in the competition. But we'll talk a little bit more about like those strategies and stuff at a later time. But I just want to kind of give you a little bit of an insight of what's been going on with my training, my diet, my nutrition, what are some of the goals moving forward. Really appreciate you watching. Uh, again, if anyone's also interested in learning more about our methods and what we do, uh, you also want to check out the links below. We got our Powerlifting for the People seminar coming up on January 19th. For anyone that's in the kind of the New York, Long Island area, or if you want to travel for it, that'd be great. So you can check out the links in the description below. Thank you guys for watching and following me on my journey to 198 class. Really appreciate you watching. Until next time, stay strong, and we'll see you soon.